in our machines, things might happen that are not predicted by the standard model. So um, actually, we know for sure the standard model doesn't work right because it doesn't incorporate gravity in the way that we really want. We want the gravitation force also to be to agree with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, if it is a fundamental physical principle of the model, it's it's a package deal. You have to take the entire theory or throw it away. You can't have quantum mechanics halfway. So it means that the gravitation force itself should also be subject to quantum mechanics. And this is where we know that today's understanding of physics stops. We have all sorts of candidate theories of, of gravity. When string theorists tell you tell you that string theory is a candidate theory, the word candidate means not. It's not a theory. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, even string theorists in, in, in rare moments of humility will tell you that string theory is not a theory. Yes. It's not even a string theory or string theory. Yeah, so, so, but, you know, I, when I say this thing, that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, running a risk, which is that people not take things very seriously. It is a very serious, a very important approach. It has a marvelous mathematical structure in it that could well, in principle, supersede the standard model. But there is something else that things don't have. It's, again, not complete. It has uh, shortcomings very similar to the sound model itself, but it doesn't describe in all circumstances what happens. So, uh, in that sense, it, it, it's a modest, but interesting progress by itself. Well, also, I mean, it's much less specific than the standard model. So, the standard model at least describes all of this, yes. whereas string theory doesn't even obviously right. describe all this. Okay. Those, all that kind of criticism, you can utter in the case of string theory, which you have to remember that it's a very difficult problem they are addressing, and they found a very remarkable mathematical structure. Could you just explicitly name a few things that you had in mind that, that string theory cannot answer? It felt like you had a few specific uh, items on your mental list. Well, uh, string theory, as it turns out to be, uh, is a whole collection of models, and string theory doesn't answer properly how of those must somehow be compactified. The theory doesn't tell us in advance how to compactify it. It says any, anything goes as far as string theory is concerned, which means there are millions of different string theories because there are millions of different ways to compactify the excellent engines. And not only that, you can capture fluxes in these excellent engines and nobody tells you how to do that. And in fact, everything is allowed in principle and that gives you, unfortunately, a whole variety of different models that can the whole landscape. So it's a whole landscape. But um, there's something more fundamental going on if you try to add gravity to the same model. And this is something I always put my finger on. I thought this is the real difficulty that we have to address, which is black holes. Gravity itself, standard gravity of Einstein, admits a solution to the equations. The solution is called a black hole. There are various kinds of black holes, they're called a family of solutions. And in principle, if you add gravity to the standard model, there will be no logical reason to exclude that in a certain way black holes can also form. Those black holes should be part of the system. And if the theory doesn't say properly how black holes behave, there's something wrong. Now, uh, the black holes can come in all sizes, in particular very tiny ones. And the very tiny ones are the nasty ones. It reminds me of mosquitoes when I was in North Finland. <laughs> big mosquitoes, the little mosquitoes, and very little mosquitoes. The very little ones were the most nasty ones in the world. So that's most of also black holes, but the tiniest ones are the most difficult to understand. In principle, there are solutions of equations, and according to quantum mechanics, anything that is a solution is actually should be there somewhere as a virtual state that you have to take into account. So these very tiny black holes you have to take into account properly. And my belief is in my string theory, no standard model, no nothing, takes black holes into account to be correct. String theory makes a big effort, but they avoid others who part of the black holes. And um, uh, black holes, they have already been mentioned. Uh, uh, and uh, black holes, they have a, a very interesting we would like to think that black holes are a form of matter. That seems to be a natural thing to believe, that, that there are particles in 
uh, in model, but also black holes. What is the difference, difference between patterns and black holes? None, if you think about it. They must be the same sort of thing. Somehow you should have a universal description of everything, including particles and, and black holes. So that's still the part of our understanding missing. Now, the one thing I mentioned already about black holes is that you, see, you can count something. And that's where black holes become extremely intriguing. You can count the number of states a black hole can be in. And the theory is very indirect, very unavoidable. So it seems to be a beautiful theory that black holes can be a number of states. And that tells a lot about nature that you actually didn't know. That the states you're counting also count how many ways can particles behave in the vicinity of a black hole. All that's included. The black hole includes particles around it. And all that can come in a finite number of states. And that gives a drastically different answer to the question whether nature is discrete or analog. The standard model thought, according to the standard model, nature seems to be analog, but that is forgetting gravity. Now, including gravity, you get black holes, suddenly everything seems to become discrete. It looks like a discrete quantum computer, much like what you said, that uh, black holes can be in a finite number of states, just how many states fit on the horizon, and that's a discrete number, it's a finite number, and it, uh, if quantum mechanics still holds for them, there's no reason why it shouldn't, then it means that you have a quantum discrete system. So the next step to believe is somehow if we were ever able to make a superior model, a model better than the standard model, it should somehow incorporate black holes in a discrete number of states. And that turns every real number in the system basically into a integer number of states. And of, of course, Deep inside, uh, many of us here, but not so many other people in physics, think that nature should somehow be discrete and should be controlled by, uh, uh, by integers. And uh, information wise, that's far to be preferred. Eventually, uh, the laws of nature determine whether a meteorite will be falling on our heads you know, uh, within an hour from now. There's a meteorite coming, you don't know it, I don't know it, but maybe it's coming. And it's determined by laws of physics, laws of nature. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> laws, laws of nature tell us where this meteorite will fall from here. But according to quantum mechanics, according to standard physics, we simply have no way to tell. It's fundamentally impossible to tell because these are real numbers and the thing can come, go and come anywhere. But somehow we think, you know, our gut feeling is there should be a, a model of nature where this is just controlled by finite amounts of information. Very, very large amounts of finite. And uh, that determines whether or not the meteorite will be uh, falling on our heads like that. Um, so, so that is, um, uh, that turns the whole system we're talking about into an information processing machine. And that's what some people here also have been for a long time, it looks as if nature is an information processing machine. And that's the picture that you seem to be getting out of this relatively simple arguments that, uh, that stand models with, with gravity and black holes, so as the gravity and black holes, that, that together changes the picture completely. It turns nature to an information processing machine which is just a computer. And now the question is, is this a quantum computer or is it a classical computer? And when you reach this stage, you say, ah, that's a quantum computer, because it's all quantum mechanics, and nature can be in a linear superposition state, so it should be a quantum computer. But now comes the other element in the theory, which I don't think has been talked properly yet, which is the subject of cosmology. That is, you want to describe the entire universe, not only us sitting here, or sitting on planet Earth, or planet Earth going around the sun, but you want to describe the entire universe and understand not only what its laws of nature are, but also what its initial conditions are, its initial state, and how it should evolve. Now, in quantum mechanics, you can take an initial state, after a while you get a quantum superposition. But somehow, that's not the world that we see here. We don't see us sitting in a quantum superposition around this table. Everybody has a seat around this table. It's not a quantum superposition. So there's still something wrong with quantum mechanics. Now, this is the objection that Einstein already 
put forward against Roman theory and has been ridiculed away. Uh, Einstein has lost his battle against Niels Bohr, according to historians of science. I actually don't believe that. That Einstein did not lose the battle. He, he lost the battle and not the war because. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 how do you, so, you know, one, there's this, these efforts, according to a theory of de environmentally induced decoherence and decoherent histories okay. of Gilman and Butterall and others, okay. to try to explain why we only see, why people like classical kinds of things like us only see one thing at a time. So, you, am I correct that you don't accept those arguments? Not quite. Not okay. Uh, so, uh, if you could say uh, a word or two about that. Without. Well, you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> well, the way to go about this is that they divide quantum mechanics into two parts. One is Schrodinger's equation and everything else, and the other is the collapse of the wave function. And that's a very ugly aspect of quantum mechanics, whereas the Schrodinger equation is extremely clean and straightforward. Right, so these decoherence like arguments try to avoid ever mentioning the word collapse of the wave function, which actually always gives me a Well, they replace it in words by decoherence, but for me, decoherence is the same thing. I'm uh, saying that the wave function somehow collapses. Uh, in a microscopic sense, you wait until things become microscopic, and then you allow it to collapse. <coughs> but you can't really avoid that notion. I, th I think people who do, who do that work would strongly object to that characterization of it, but that's okay. Well, Come on. <laughs> I wouldn't be saying these things if I wouldn't have an alternative. Yeah, um, I, uh -huh. My alternative Please. is somewhat similar to what Ed was saying, but I go back to my other favorite model, the planetary system, and say that is just about as quantum mechanical, nearly as quantum mechanical as a standard model. To explain the, uh, I say the following thing. Think of the planets going around the sun and various ellipses and so on. Here's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and so on. I introduce in this system an operator. It's the Earth-Mars interchange operator. So here's Earth, here's Mars. I put Earth where Mars is, I put Mars where Earth is, and I can eat nothing. Now, why should you do that? Apparently, the scientists tell me for some reason they can't do it. But um, so just imagine, imagine that you put, uh, put our Mars or Earth is Earth and Mars and allow this thing to continue. Well, you can calculate what would happen. What would happen is they'll do some same things after a while. I think planetary scientists say that the whole system would become entirely unstable and something terrible would happen if I ends up with Earth at where it was before. Well, maybe not, maybe it does, but uh, strange things happen in the planetary system would be a thing like this. But we could also say, let's look at the state, at the eigenstatus operator. The square of the Earth Mars integration operator is 1. Because then we have the situation, same situation as before. And if you interchange it, you interchange back the same situation as before. This is an operator whose squares is 1. So if you diagonalize the operator, you have plus 1 and minus 1. So there are two states. There's a plus 1 state and a minus 1 state. Even Earth Mars parity state and all Earth Mars parity state. And you can ask how they evolve. And this is what we in, do in quantum mechanics all the time. So we have operators of the sort of quantum mechanics, and we ask how those operators op uh, evolve in time. We say they are observable. But they are not more or less observable than the Earth and Mars interchange operator. For some reason in a planetary system, we never use that operator. We think it's crazy, it's nonsense. It's not useful. That's because the Earth position operator and the Mars position operator are just perfect to describe how planets move, and we don't need this crazy thing. The difference with all this complicated is that we don't know what the ontological operators are. We don't know what the position operators are. We mix them all up. And if you now consider a cellular automaton, like some people here have been looking at a lot, Actually, in the cellular automaton, you can also introduce operators that tell you what the state of the operator is, of the whole automaton is. But you can also introduce uh, the operator which interchanges some uh, elements in the operator. I say, uh, uh, there's one thing which was up. Suppose I replace it by a down and let the operator, the whole of automaton continue its way. But you make one switch in, in all the elements and you, uh, you, you ask, how is it? How does it evolve? It will evolve mm -hmm. automatically to totally different. Right? Totally different kind of all the elements of the world.